agnostic and card players. We are doing this. This is the very, very first time that we're doing it in Johannesburg in South Africa. In Southern Africa. It had been going on for three years in Nairobi. And what better way than to have the upcoming book by Putumi Nsameni, who is a Giants Fellow. And the book is called The Wanderers. And with us is my brother, the trombonist, the pianist, the amazing musician, Malcolm Gianni. And um, we're doing it very experimental this particular time, because normally it would be an actor and a musician that I would have done it with. But, um, you know, we're being experimental, and uh, I guess so, why not? Let's see. Right. So. Generation white Tanzanian of Jewish artistry, who means well, but tend to be overly enthusiastic about wishing to be seen as fully integrated into the Bongo of life. He comes from old German money and doesn't really know how to relate to people without using his riches as show of his affection. Other than that, he's a brilliant surgeon and a bright laugh. To mitigate the feeling of dislocation amongst too many strangers, you invited Sandy along to this party also. Sandy is the only person among your colleagues who you really started to become friendly with. Nurses and doctors don't always get along. Now you two, you just clicked from day one. This is, however, your first time socializing together outside of work. Sandy doesn't like your host of anything. She says he has a fakery about him. Having a fake walkers is a cardinal sin, the lowest personality trait in Sandy's eyes. She might be right about him because he has taken you out once or twice. But something has always been off between you. Besides, your thoughts and feelings are someone else. With a guy you knew years ago, who now lives in Germany. Waiters walked around the grand room preparing, presenting platters with such delicacies as was Sandy Royalty, who is quietly a prostitute. Sandy pops a water into her mouth, chills, and pulls her face. You suppress a laugh and your conversation. A discussion of a topic regarding which you discover you have much in common. Absent fathers. Hers, a colored man from Cape Town, promised to stand for Sandy as a Tanzanian mother when he left in 1993. As soon as he settled back in South Africa, they never had to. Why should we go looking for you? Sandy says when you ask. Tapping her long, beautiful fingers, that tap her in the finger against the side of the glass. He's the one who knows where we are. You recognize the kindred spirit in her. Absent fathers is the silent Salafka pandemic. As she talks, Sandy gesticulates, pointing and waving animatedly as if she's rehearsed the speech. She wears long dreadlocks, which tonight are pulled back in time. They smell of fresh lavender and avocado. At work, she tucks them other in Gallery. She soon moves on to one of her other favorite topics, music, especially what she calls African soul. By this, she means an eclectic mix of black folk music fused with contemporary beats for global music. She spent half a 
happiness can also kiss. Rap music is the bomb, girl. The beat, man. The energy. The pulse of those who live in the deeps. It seems to you that living in the deeps is Simon's favorite expression. You are not sure what it means, but you get the drift. You tell her that you get the same feeling when listening to old school rap like that of Tupac, who to you is not only a modern poet, but a prophet of your urban black oppressed lives. So far, Byron sent his companionship. This evening is a slow torture for you, because it's the kind of vibe where ever's on steroids, where only the narcissistic types thrive. The general talk is about stock options, fashion shows, and holidays in Europe. The atmosphere is more perfumed than Paris Boulevard, with undertones of flattering pheromones everywhere. Sally and you are bored and out of place in all of this. Sally pops her head when Zucchero shoots my baby plays over the speaker, strategically placed throughout the room. Come on, she says, striding over to the big screen on the entertainment system. Brave as an arrow, she takes the music remote control, stops Zucchero's choking misery, and scrolls the YouTube channel to two parts changes. She then drags you onto the dance floor. You are reluctant, and it shows a little in a rather unenthusiastic. Sadly, all but reprimands you. Dance with your sister's soul, not your body. That's how you connect with your friends. Let their energy move you in your veins. She moves her knees to the beat. The music is either in your blood or it is loose. Let your soul take over. Don't kill the spontaneity of it. For a black people, my sister. We know everything by feeling, deep feeling, men not by it. We use feeling to take part in those beyond time. That is why we have divided and spiritual guides. But you don't get that because you're too invested in the Western organization with the intellectual. You click your tongue and then she laughs. <laughs> you can't help but laugh too. Closing your eyes, you try to give yourself to the music. It is rather cheeky of the two of you to take over the playlist like this. But what better way to remind the guests about the elephant in the room? The American police brutality against yet another black person, Atiana Jefferson, at Atiana Jefferson, shot dead through the window of her apartment in the presence of an eight-year-old nephew. That has been on the news all week, but which no one at this party is talking about. As the song ends, you open your eyes and notice disapproving looks and the stand quiet. You and Sandy burst out laughing and leave the room to smoke as well outside. But being painted as problematic duckies, you say to her when you sat down in the stool. What else is new? She struts, lighting the zone fish from her handbag. Hip hop is the way we finally learn how to shock our attention to the world that ignores our pain. It opened an outlet for black youth to run back at the world that strangled them, especially in the US, that assaults against black life by whiteness. She thinks for a while. The guy jazz was for older folks, you know? But where blues and jazz controlled us about the oppression on plantation fields, hip hop is a weapon, sticks and stones, bricks and monotones, against the system designed to suppress us. The fact that white kids took up the genre is just another example of them appropriating what is exotic to them for their own greed. <sighs> the wheel is making a chat. Don't get me wrong. There are those whites we 
refuse hate falls from the very side that you have to lose them. Which is like, okay. Those ones. We can use it, they use us. After all, the real enemy is capitalism. The real root of slavery and racism. It is only when we defeat capitalism that our true humanity will emerge. But I'm not holding my breath that this will happen in my lifetime. The higher the two of you get, the funnier your little start on the dance floor seems. I think you may have blown your chances of getting laid tonight there, Sister Uru. Sandy giggles. Thursdays to hang will not drop when you caught the Russian problem. Thinking about your guy in Germany. You take another drag. Damn, girl, where did you get this stuff? It's heavy, it's transcaring me. Your head starts buzzing, starting to be high over the crack. You feel nauseous, as usual. We just let you. Sandy throws her arm around your shoulder. There's a perceptible pull, the narrowing of eyes before Sandy takes up a discussion of blue. And the more time has passed. Only 10 soils of mature enough yet to compete at the level of Chupa Bada, lyrical vibes. Do you listen to me, the Google? Uh -huh. You've never heard of it. She's the bomb of Kenzo, girl. Huh? Very likes like the community that sets it to the 40 laughs, really at once. Uh -huh. That brings out the shimmer of her personality. Her smoky eyes turn gray when she gets animated like this. She takes out her phone from a bag, plugs earphones into the phone, and hands one side to you. You both listen, head to head, to lips. You are blown away by the pleasing eclectic style, the fusion of four languages, Swahili, French, Luo, and English. After that, Sandy fake seriousness and says, Why do you mean you haven't heard of African soul girl? Why do you think fell out? Middle Matera and freshly ground scene. And then your music lesson on African soul intensifies. By the time it ends, you are wishing you were proficient in playing the activity in a room. In the weeks following the swanky party, you spend most of your off weekend with Sandy. With a long pan African swish and skirt made from only natural material and uh hand, -huh. like hemp and cotton, she gives an aura of ancient Numidian wisdom. She talks of visit to Shashamene, the Ethiopian Rastafarian town, is obsessed with coffee and wants to open a good coffee shop that sells authentic African beans from Ethiopia and Kenya one day. She talks sadly about the Ethiopian coffee planters, the originators of the crafts I exploited in the so-called free market of the world. The system sucks for us with the dick in hand, she says. You spend those afternoons drinking slowly, usually Laziza, a Lebanese beer, Sandy Lights, listening to Sukos music, which are learning to appreciate or folk music from the American coffee saying days, which is more to your taste. You both love folk music. Sandy says it brings the drowsy wisdom from the ancient fatigue of black lives. You don't really know what drowsy wisdom is, but you dig the dig anyways. When you tell her that you grant the opportunity to come work in Tanzania because you saw it as a chance to find out more about your absent father, Sandy is intrigued. You relate the disappointing and abrupt end to your investigation, which had simply led you to his brain. But upon hearing Pat's name and former occupation, she lets out a particularly forceful, uh -huh. and says, I know who that is, and I know his widow. I'll take you to your father's wife.
about the literature of the human spirit, which they termed Bobaya Poetia, the new poetry. And how that connects with Buddha's old call, the belt literature. To understand the pain of JD and Bloke taking their last breaths before an end. To understand what drove those wanderers and sojourners to feed their souls of foreign diets.
you know, put on his books are out there, but we don't see your we don't see your music. And I thought we were gonna get like vinyls and stuff. Oh yeah. Uh, apologies about that. Uh, but the music uh, it's not the way I see it. All right. Um well there is a vinyl out called Spaza, right? Uh, it just came out this year. Uh, you could uh, just get it on their camp, you know, all the social uh, media platforms. Okay, so we, we can get it on iTunes and Spotify. Yes, all right. Um, okay. All right. Um, uh, I'm pressed. Okay. Uh, well, the other music is coming out. Very soon. Um, so, you know. How soon? Oh, I have an iPad. Okay, this is I'm breaking out. What's going to be? I have a, an album that's coming out uh, in September. Uh, it's called The Kid. So. Well, okay. You, you, know, you know why this is perfect, right? Because your book is coming out next month. Yeah. And so. Mm -hmm. Maybe a collab in December. Yeah, you guys? I, where's James? I thought James would be here. We, we, we needed him to intervene here. Why? I know, to, to give us a collaboration. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. 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 You, you, you. Oh, yeah, no, no, you. Shout out James. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, you will, you will, you will. Oh, oh, no, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Did you invite him? I did actually, but he had some real but he said he would try out. That's why I'm saying, but we could finalize this thing now and say in September we come for a real uh, collaboration of the music. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. You, um, you know, I mean, your debut novel, there's a lot of people won the UJ Prize, but like, what took you so long to write? Why wouldn't you write to your paper? <laughs> That's an interesting question. Can everybody hear me? It yeah. seems I don't listen in paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I had this dream that when I, I hit 50, I will start uh, writing. Mm -hmm. And then I'll be uh, uh, work my way towards full time writing because I'm not a full time writer by profession. But I have, I have been doing some uh, research which I surprised me when I realized that I did not know my own piece. Uh -huh. So I had been doing that, and then one day, before I even hit 50, I heard Tabiso uh, speaking at 7 o'clock with Yusuf, and I'm like, ah, oh, there's a, a black woman who's starting a publishing house. And I think that's nice. So I took the number, and I found her, and then the rest is history. Yeah. <laughs> But your journey has been longer. You've been doing music for ages, and you, you're like known on two instruments: the piano and the trump uh, and the trombone. Tell us a bit about that. Okay. Oh, I started music uh, at the age of sixteen. Yeah? At music at the age of sixteen. A school founded by the late Robert uh, Tatijoni Mukwa. Mm -hmm. Well, I grew up with three children. Huh? The, the children's home is called uh, Kids Heaven. Mm -hmm. So, I joined the family. Yeah. And then, and then he showed me the world. And how has it been so far? I mean, you were just recently in Kimberley doing, doing a gig. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, now uh, I'm starting to take my work to the people, which is really exciting. exciting. Uh, it's been a long time I'm trying to set up myself for what's coming. But now it's a born to the Wanderers, which is what we are listening to today, is coming out in July, and it's quite distinctly different from 
uh, Broken River Tent, in that it's more contemporary history, really. Um, what led, but it also like, as I was reading it, I, I felt so much like you were bleeding on the page in a way that perhaps you didn't quite do with, um, with Broken River Tent, as beautiful as it is. What led to that creation? What was, you know, what was so urgent about it that you were in a space where you were like, no, this is a, this is a story that I need to be, that needs to be told. Because I remember when I was telling um, Mujeks about it, and he was like, oh my God, this is like the story of our fathers. I was like, yes, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, as I said, you remember, I've just said that I started writing because I was reading history. I, I still consider myself actually as a more of a reader than a writer. Just a reader that uh, read a lot until I had my own opinion. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this actually, this this book, uh, I do something. I I am an, a, a very how can I say restless mind. When I write something, I, I write about two two manuscripts at a time. So I use another manuscript as an overlap of something I don't need on that hour. You understand? When I, I look at something and I said, okay, that doesn't belong here. So I put it. So uh, in a way. You this, wrap yourself up? You do a yeah. Up? In a way, they, 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 these books, I wrote them simultaneously, mm -hmm. these two books. And then you would see uh, in, a, in a sense that one is a story of this young man who meets up with a kind of a, his ancestor, and then he almost assumes the voice of the ancestor, which is Makoma, the king of Amanyaga. And then one is a story of a young woman that is looking for his father, and then did not understand he, her father. I mean, never met her father. And then she reads from his diaries that he, he wrote in Tanzania, and she ended up assuming the voice of her father. So I realized that, um, I think I suppose uh, on the program with my terms because it's a book more of about war and all that stuff. There was just too much to So I needed <laughs> something to calm me down while I was doing the, all the war stuff. So now this mostly, if you can see the Wanderers, it's a very feminine book. And the, the, the protagonists are mostly women, all of them. Okay, perhaps parts is not a, a one, but Initially, I wanted the story to be the story of uh, Ruru's mother than Pats, mm -hmm. but Pats overwhelmed the story. Took it over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Took it over. So yeah, in a, in a way itself, it, it, it was an or, or an, an overlap uh, manuscript that itself ended up uh, too big for its shoes. Mm -hmm. Because the thing about me, I I get a little bit irritated when people just point. You know, sometimes. There are big issues we live with. And then people sometimes when they write, they feel that it's enough to just mention it without interrogating them. Mm -hmm. So now immediately I, I finished the Broken River Tent. I went into this and I'm like, okay, if he was living with a Rwandan woman, why is she in Tanzania? Mm -hmm. And then now I ended up with a Rwandan hey, genocide. And then it, it I, I remember the two countries, one in 94 was under the genocide uh, fog. We uh, were under the hope that we when in 94, it's a new country. And then now come 2008, it feels as if the, the roads have been swamped. Like Rwanda is much more hopeful than us. We are becoming despondent. So the reason why I decided that parts will not come back from exile, I wanted somebody who will look into South Africa from a distance. Wow. You understand from a distance, and he was but also loving it enough, yeah, loving it to enough always because, be following on one yeah, and every time because he was part of the MK. So, but then I wanted him to look and into it, to look into its faults, into its failed hopes, and all that stuff. Basically, I just wanted to interrogate the, the times that were living in what so, went so wrong. Do you think you've got like a, an underlying hope for? Almost like the unity of, of, of Africa as a continent. Almost uh, Because I think that's what you know your work is speaking to. Yeah. First of all, South Africans are we I've never met a South African who's really gonna be like that granular or care about it, that granular about you know, people outside of the yeah. country and the follow the story of following. Yeah. You know, to even find out that, you know, some of your families outside of the country, you know, like yeah. talking about diasporas and all that type of stuff. Yeah. So do you think your work speaks to like a sentiment of unity on the continent as a whole, somehow. Yeah, most definitely. I, I particularly, uh, personally, 
don't respect the African borders much. So to me, they mean nothing. You understand that because we saw that you see there's some people that we were talking the other day, and to you 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 would say she's Zimbabwean, and they, and yet our clan are, are the same. We have the same clan name. So just because the colonial put a border between us, that has no value to me. You understand? But the point I'm trying to say is, uh, as much as I love Africa uh, as it owns the history, I look at us as the same people. Right. But I also look beyond that. I have, uh, my look is more humanistic. I mean, even my approach into literature is what Gute was trying to do, the world literature, basically. It's like, where does uh, the African soul fit into all of this? Because they, they have suppressed us for so many times. But that, that is my approach for me. Your, 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 um, your inspiration, uh, Malcolm, you know, when you think about music, who are those, those giants on his shoulder you stand uh, on? You know, where you're like, no, these are my guys. I would like, I aspire to, or this person led me to do this. And, you know. You think, uh... <laughs> Uh, well, <clears throat> my inspiration really to learn to do is when I came from the group particular. Uh, well, there are people in visuals that I can point and say, hey, yeah, we are quite from there, of course. But I'm more obsessed with this person who created this whole thing. So my inspiration really it's with it money or it whatever. But 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 with that with that said, um you know where do you where do you place your music? I, I, I guess where you place your music like on this continent in this world, where do you see yourself? Like if fifty years from now people discover Malcolm Giannis music, what do they want? What do you want them to say about it? You. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to put it humanly, since I'm talking to people like right? well, I see myself growing like nature and the parts of my growth, but there's nothing different um, why I'm growing and this tree and what's coming next. It's the fruits, but nature and laws of nature. But you know, I should ask Malcolm this question, because when I was listening to him, I know he, he talks about Jonas Guanga and all of that. That's his kind of inspiration. But as I was listening, I was thinking, we're in Sophia Town, and I'm looking at Father Trevor Hanks. He's the one who actually gave uh, human circle his first horn. And then that's how I, uh, you must say, I got the inspiration to play the horn. And I'm like, it's so, it's so amazing, like, to live under the shadow of, of history. Like, look at this house also. This was Dr. Ngoma's house. And then, like, when you, you look at these things from the distance, it's almost so real. Yeah. If you know what I mean. Okay. Yeah. And there any, yes. Okay, Malcolm. Um, as you mentioned, you know, you have right? Because, I mean, we all have access to music from the time we're children, but I think it requires love for someone to, to morph from listening to the music to making music. And I think for most of us, it stays at listening to the music and whatever. I think there must be love for you to morph it. Like, instead of um, listening to the things that I would say, I'm going to, uh, I don't know, give birth to the song in my heart. When did that happen to you? Do you have a specific memory of Thinking a melody and thinking, I want to create instead of consume. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Well, my first interaction or my first memory yeah. of music, my father was a taxi driver, right? I yeah. think I was uh, four or three. So, so he picked me up some, you know, and he pumped this song. I wrote a song by William McKinnon. Uh, 
when life happens, you go it's a big life. Uh, and then went back to Western music. Uh, Dr. Johnny Maguire. I remember when this the first time he played the trumpet, my hair stood up. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, and I remember looked at the receipts. Any, any other questions before we go into this final beautiful little session that we're going to have? Oh, can I ask the owner of the Um, You say that this current book is more feminine, right? Whereas, like, they have more female protagonists, I guess, than the previous work. Um, how do you embody, like, as a man, like, I know you're creative, how do you embody the female psyche? What do you have to tap into? To try and make be careful how you I answer this. Question. Be careful how you answer this question. Where does your female? Why do you find it? It's a loud question. <laughs> I could cheat and uh, and say the advantage of, in my life is that I have always been surrounded by women. I was raised by a single father, I mean single mother. Uh, my children, the majority of them are girls. Uh, at home, majority of my siblings are girls. The only, you know, so in a way, uh, I, I, it does not make me uh, an expert, but it does give me a sense of uh, empathy and an idea. Like for instance, I'll, I'll tell you the, the voice of Ruru in my head is the voice of my daughter, Pani. Mm -hmm. So when, I, I, when I'm, I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, I know. So that's, 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 that's my voice of Ruru in my head. So like, um, I, I remember the, the, being, being a, a, a creative writer uh, requires many things. Uh, when I was writing about my trauma, I realized that uh, that's how I try to, I realize how colonized I am, that I can't think in person. So I, I, I needed to get rid of the English. So I first uh, wrote my commas um, story in my head in person. That's the only way I could get the tone right. You know, so because I needed that, that, that tone. And as a result, if you read the Broken River 10, you will see that the, the, the English of my comma is a little bit different than the English of uh, other people. Because in my coma, I'm trying to speak Tosa in English. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you understand? So it's it's the same it's the same thing. I I don't like. Uh, I I know there's so much arguments about appropriations now, but the thing is, it can't be if I'm a creative writer that I can only write about a 50 year old male that is Tosa. This is how it defeats the whole purpose of being creative. Because being creative means you, you can empathize with other people. You can see their point of view, and then you can look at things from their point of view. And uh, this this helped me uh, a lot also uh, psychologically, getting rid of my male rubbish. You understand? So because I'm, I'm looking at things from the, a woman's point of view. And it, it was amazing how refreshing it was. Simple things I couldn't understand, like, uh, how if you are a female, you are walking on a deserted beach, you don't feel safe. Do you get those things? Yes, yes, some of the things I took for granted, I take for granted. So I had to reimagine this thing from a woman's point of view now. But this is how women feel all the time. This unsafe all the time. You understand? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I think, um, you know, you and I have had this conversation that what often people give appropriation it's not so much that they're saying they don't want an artist to be able to, what you call it, but they want an artist to be able to interpret the other with empathy, with, yeah. with understanding in a multidimensional way. So the moment that you do, oh, you know, uh, uh, black people from the township are like A, B, C, X, Y, Z, and you do that typical thing, then people then get offended yeah, yeah. and they, yeah, and because you know, you're because you're stereotyping yeah. and people are much, so much more complex than that, you know, and art is more complex than that. 
Um, any other questions? Okay, one more. <laughs> Shut up. Okay. Um, in terms of writing, right, and how do you start? Because I've read a lot of um, literature from the continent that has gained world acclaim. And I've noticed, like a pattern, right, that uh, literature from the continent that makes it be out there in the world has to sort of ravish Africa. You know what I mean? It has to be a tragedy of some sort. Like, I want to read stuff that infuses Africa with joy. We can't always like, I mean, we're very joyful. Like if you look at a, like if you look like at a, a traffic light, whatever it is, and someone is in there and they say this, whatever it is, chances are the people in the text are more likely to be laughing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like as much as Africa is problematic and we have a ton of problems, I am scared that as an African writer, that sometimes when I write it's too joyful, then they're going to say it's irrelevant. Because, well, how can you be in Africa and, and having so much joy? Like, and I'm trying not to self betray by putting stuff in literature that is all problematic, that's going to anthropologize blackness, that's going to say post apartheid, whatever it is, because there's love, there's joy, just day to day normal. How do you stay away? How do you keep away? Do you even see it as a problem? As writing about the problem that Africa is having. I think the, the short of it is you stay real. If you stay real, you are not going to uh, whitewash the problems, but also you're not going to overlook the choice because you know, you know your real experiences. Like, uh, you see, if you remember, there's a, uh, I'm remembering now where FY is like uh, talking and say, but you people always ask Rwanda when you talk to us, you want to talk about the genocide. Uh, about the genocide. Mm -hmm. You think we, we were born killing each other? Mm -hmm. We also had joys. We were going to the river. Mm -hmm. We were falling in love. Why can't you talk about that? And then this is what I was trying to talk about. That, but it's just because a person was a Rwandan and experienced the genocide of '94 does not mean that they, their life was tragic. Yeah, that's not the truth. Do you understand? That, yeah. Place. Yeah, so like this is the same thing with us with with, with, with apartheid. I, I make uh, uh, actually I I, I learned uh, parts my experiences of growing in, in the township, and then I was uh, at Quella. The 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 leader was a little bit a, a, a white person. And then she's like, oh, it's so wonderful." to hear the experiences of the township in the 80s. We always hear about necklace. We never hear about people, how they live. And then I'm like, that's the thing. We just say, yeah, that's fine. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then, like, uh, don't write for other for other cases. So, mm -hmm. You understand? Don't write for your own self. What you are trying to do, for me, writing is a process of growing consciousness, you know, growing my consciousness. So if I haven't gained something by writing, I don't see the point of it. Because myself, it must feed my, my, my consciousness. But I need to move forward from where. I mean, sometimes you can uh, be um, addressing traumas, but that's not the point. Of, like, the, the most important is, is to grow your consciousness as a human being. That's the point of writing. All right. And look to the future and know that you know we're going to go to Mars and it's happening. Elon is in power. So it's going to be good at that. <laughs> <laughs> So the story to be told on Mars. Thank you, guys. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Let's see. Now you want to go with your with, with, with your person with Elon to, to colonize another space. We're gonna colonize something. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
We awake with the sun igniting with fire on the immense sea surface. You go outside to meet the morning. The ocean is foaming and shivering on the rocks, giving you the shivers also. You walk towards the soft colors of the upper multi tacos and the seekers wrinkled faces of fishermen in their shirt, with their shacks, checking the ocean's pride through the elements of their poverty. You make your way to the press as they go to sea on their dogs. The sea crawls trains to and fro, sky in the sea. Dog sails in the dazzling golden light of the sun, watching over them, flaming into patience of seamen. People shout in languages that you don't understand. This bars you from blending in and exposes your fake arbitrary attitude. Like a gadfly, your mind refuses to rest, so you walk towards the rocky side of the beach where women are collected clouds and buckets. The corrugated sand is still a little icy on your feet when you take off your clothes. The beach path you take carries you to a slightly deserted bend where you encounter a rather straggled stream into a shallow estuary as the streamless crouches to the sea. You do a little risk assessment in your head and feel no elementary danger, which is how you would, sadly, feel in South Africa as a female alone on a slightly deserted part of the beach. Another part of being in Tanzania has been the slow letting your gut slip in such situations. It gives you deep shame to admit that the culture of violence in your country, especially against women, is not necessarily from poverty, but from a patriarchal sense of male entitlement to female bodies. Perhaps there are also some national, hidden national traumas left or first untreated from the apartheid era in the psyche of your men. This morning, fate has beautiful things to show you. As you make the bend, the vastness of the sea and the library of silence as it creates becomes audible and visible. You spy your first white rainbow above the horizon. You had read about four balls, but never seen one in real life before. You interpret this to be some kind of good sign for the coming years of your life. You decide to investigate a little. There's a sense of formation that creates a natural channel for the pounding waves to form runny runnels of small caves. You hike your skirts as you dip your feet. The sea kissed wind dampened your face. You walk to the other side of the cliff where the wind sighs on the caves as the sea claps against the rock. You venture again to the sea to see if you can even stroke on the marks of history that reside in these caves. Only a pair of what looks like any of these are curious about your doings. You walk back to the beach part thinking about how you read somewhere that they make for life. And one of them commits suicide when the partner dies. Sometimes by violently throwing themselves down at him. You cast your mind to the meaning of your father's journals for you. You see how they become memory residues left behind by the receding tide like an envoy of his life.
I feel as old as the hills. What if years before and one return to this years when he woke up on the shore of Ithaca to be found by his patron goddess, Athena, that should disguise him as an old man, that you may appear mean in the sight of all the boys and of thy wife. All face is wandering of wanderers. I'm tired of craning my neck out of the window. I feel exhaustion laden on my shoulders. I pray this cup passes from my lips. That is a frightful mirror that quivers even the soul of a god. But when you've lived too long, a dead threshold, you go on to fear to such an extent that death loses its power to scare. It becomes meaningless. I'm now not afraid of death. Thank you. 
Thomas Akele is probably the criticist of this type. We still talk about him in his heroic life. The manner in which obsession with revenge took his anger to the point where he consumed his life only because he trusted in his own strength too much. Worse still, think of Euripides Hecuba, that anomalous version of the Trojan War story with a shocking moral ugliness. Perhaps still the most insightful drama of the poison in the state of revenge. This prompted that to put her in the inferno where the ranch should have acted like a dog. A dog so like a was with her mind. Now, passion for revenge doesn't really interest me. I'm drawn to those who achieve immortality, not by the controls of the Greek and the Romans, but the, by the bare knuckles of their faith. That indomitable strength against the annihilating effect of uncertainty. Yes, I seek my elucidation from the life. The quintessential wanderer and the equinox of this phenomenon. It's obvious it is the spirit we seek, not the moon. Abraham's life man tried to kill his own son, but through two great poetic lives. You have to have gone beyond common humanity to reach that state of crisis in your life. Imagine. Praying for a son all those years, and when he arrives, you place a blame on his neck because of the whispers of faith. My God! I Symbol for reconciliation. They made him into a justification for their immoral gaze against the demands of justice. They used him as an instrument against our hope for justice. Mandela is now a symbol of their reconciliation and a burden of betrayal to those whom he purportedly freed. And where do the majority of South Africans feature in all this? Dying in remote corners within a of our bodies. Dying of hunger, curable and incurable disease. Of neglect and poverty. As things change, they stay the same. They still rely on dirt having their fingernails, what flying flakes of political freedom. Oh, this is 
Elsewhere inviting the fire minister. 